Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday morning Bible study in Genesis. Uh, today, we are going to be studying chapter 32. Chapter 32 today in Genesis. We continue the story of Jacob and his journey back home. Last week, we were in chapter 31, and we saw his conflict with Laban, his uncle, and the issues he had in, in actually leaving with his, uh, with his wives and his children. Uh, Laban was, at, you know, even right up to almost the last, he was putting up roadblocks, completely phony roadblocks, but roadblocks to Jacob leaving or at least leaving with his, <laughs> leaving with his family anyway. Uh, but finally, Laban relented in part because God appeared to him in a, in a dream and basically told him to leave Jacob alone. And that freaked Laban out enough <laughs> to, to back off in the end. All right. So now we're, uh, we're in chapter 32, and Jacob, I Jacob and his family are on the way back to, back home, back to Jacob's home. Mind you, it has been 20 years, okay? It's been 20 years that he's been in a kind of effective exile. Uh, but on his way, you will recall on his way to the uh, you know the ancestral country, on his way to meet Laban and to to meet the women who would become his his wives, uh, he was at Bethel, or he named a place Bethel because he experienced it as the Bethel, the house of God, uh, the vision of the angels ascending and descending. Um, uh, towards uh, up and down from heaven. Um, with that in mind, we begin chapter 32, because 32 is going to, the beginning of 32 is going to recall that scene, except this time it's on the way back home rather than leaving home. All right, so chapter 32, uh, verse 1. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, the angels, he said, this is God's camp. So he called that place Mahanaim. Okay, well, I'll say more about that in a sec. Actually, let's, let's pause there, because, I mean, it's, it's just two verses, but it, it sets up everything else that's going to happen. <laughs> Um, this is obviously a reference back to his experience at Bethel, uh, his vision, uh, because he just as before, he sees angels this time. Um, they're not going up and down from heaven, but he sees them. He sees them in this place where he is, and he declares that this is God's camp. Now, before he, he named the place Bethel and he called it. Uh, he called it that because he saw it as the house of God. God was meeting him here. Now, in the same way, when he sees these angels on his way back, he names this place Mahanaim. Uh, now, Mahanaim does not actually mean does not actually mean God's camp, as you might expect it would based on the language used here. He says, this is God's camp, and therefore he named it Mahane. You would think it means God's camp. It doesn't, it doesn't actually. It means two camps. <laughs> two camps. And this is a foreshadowing of something that we're going to see here in a few verses. Okay? But if you just leave it right here, it's and you cut off and didn't read anything else in Genesis, it would, well, it would leave you hanging. All right. So let's uh, let's read now. Let's read a little bit, and let's get let's actually read the whole encounter from verse three to verse twenty one. Okay, from verse three to verse twenty one. The the story that leads up to one second. Okay, that leads up to um, the famous the famous passage of Jacob wrestling 
the angel. All right, so verse three. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now. And I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you. <laughs> and 400 men are with him. <laughs> then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed for obvious reasons. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. Yeah, this is the reference to the two camps. Thinking if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And Jacob said, he prayed, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan. And now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. And so he spent that night there, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milch camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he delivered into the hands of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the foremost, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say they belong to, you, to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterwards, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. And so the present passed on ahead of him. And he himself spent the night in the camp. Ah, okay. I love this. You just can't make this up. <laughs> this is so good. All right. All right. Thoughts, reflections. I just love it. Money is thicker than blood. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Oh boy. Yeah, this is good stuff here. Yeah, so what do you think? <laughs> I guess he's had 20 years to realize that he did a really pretty rotten thing. Um, yeah. And I think he's he's probably very sincerely not just trying to, to save his own skin, but to make it up to Esau. I mean, I'm, at least I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's fair. It's fair to consider that possibility, you know, that it's not purely just selfish, self-seeking here that uh, trying to save his life, that he might actually have some contrition at this point, <laughs> especially given the fact that he's, you know, been, been messed with by his uncle. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, he's had, he's, he's experienced, 
he's been on the receiving end of this. And, uh, you know, he, <laughs> he got a taste of his own medicine and he didn't like it. Um, so, yeah. Now, of course, there's also this prayer too, which, you know, as one who, you know, at the beginning of this story, didn't know God at all, you know, except, except by reputation. Uh, and, you know, and he had the one vision there at the beginning, uh, at the beginning as he's on his way to the ancestral homeland. Um, with the exception of that, you know, he hasn't engaged with God to speak of. Um, he, you know, it really, really only does know God as the God of his ancestors, not the, not his God, not directly, yeah. not, not, or not much experience with him anyway. Um, uh, and so he is very, very, uh, he is very deferential in this prayer. He recognizes his, his helplessness. <clears throat> he recognizes that um, in some ways he recognizes that he has no reasonable expectation of Esau's mercy. Okay, that's, that's, one, that's one thing right there. Is he, he, he is aware of this, that he has no reasonable expectation of Esau's mercy. Uh, he is, frankly, scared precisely because he has no expectation of that mercy. Uh, he, you know, he, he's scared to death of what Esau may do to him. And, to, and, and this is also interesting, too. If you look at verse 11, he's, he's also concerned. Not ju- he's not just concerned about himself. He's concerned about his family, too. This is an interesting thing for him to say. Um, Deliver me uh, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. That's an interesting thing for him to say, especially in a world where children were everything. Sons in particular, but, but... Ch- but children were everything. It was your, you know, like if somebody killed your children, you know, somebody killed all your children, killed all your sons, and you're old, you know, that person is not only, you know, potentially killing you, physically killing you, but erasing you. That's the, that's, that's what's so horrified people of this of this day and time is that by a race, by killing your children too, you were, a, you were being erased from time and memory. Uh, and that was just horrifying. That was absolutely hard. I mean, it's horrifying enough to people today, I suppose, <laughs> you know, the, the thought of that, but, but in a world where everything was about family and continuing a family line, to stop a family line in its tracks is just something that people couldn't get their minds around. It was just a horrible, horrible thing. Oh, excuse it, me. What, yeah. what, haven't we seen some instances, maybe with uh, Saul, I can't recall, where God ordered them to kill every man, woman, child, and animal. So just wipe out, God has ordered them to wipe out everything. Yeah. 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 That's that's kind of what it's about. I mean, I, I mean, there's no way to make those scenes nice, but that's effectively what it is, is that it's not just a judgment on. A Thanks. OK, that's the way to steal the scene. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, no, I was going to say that the, the idea, the judgment is not just on Saul, but to judge him completely is to wipe out his posterity. It's to wipe out his family line altogether. Uh, 
And, and thus, the, 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 the flip of that, of course, is that when God affirms David, when he affirms David, he not only affirms the person of David, but he affirms David's posterity. You see? I mean, it's like the flip of, of what happens with Saul. Saul is not only rejected personally, his entire family and posterity is rejected, cut off, you know. David, flaws and all, <laughs> warts and all, he is not only affirmed by God, but his family, his descendants are affirmed by God. So we can see why this would be a real fear. Oh, yeah. Jacob. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> The thing that I think is, is worth noting here, in addition to that, I think the thing that's really note, noteworthy here is that he shows a concern for the mothers with the children. That's an interesting, I mean, I mean, it might not be such a big thing, you know, from our point of view, we look at it today, you know, all, everyone's death in the family is a is a tragedy we don't want any of it to happen naturally but for jacob the patriarch to specifically single out the possible death of the mothers is a is a is an interesting inclusion um i wonder if any of it goes back I wonder if any of it goes back to the fact that Jacob, Jacob's love, especially for Rachel, is lifted up in such a way that it, it appears extraordinary. Um, that his, his passion, his passion for Rachel, that, that Rachel, at least Rachel, is not just a is not just a child bearer <laughs> that she's that in Dave in Jacob's mind and heart she is more than just a child bearer she's she's his wife she's the one he loves you know and the thought of her death would devastate him you know and um I just oh. I, I may be reading more into it than there is but I I think it interesting that he that Jacob include his wives in this. He may, you know, Esau may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yeah, love. I have to say, when you read that, and when I read it in my in my own Bible there, I saw it much more broadly than just his wife and his children. Okay. I thought he was talking about all his servants and all the children that probably came along with the family. I mean, I, I really saw it as the whole shebang. He was okay. worried they would all be killed. Well, that would be, that would, I mean, certainly, uh, and I'm not going to dispute that. Uh, certainly if that reading is, if that reading is, is fair to the text, that would even, that would make Jacob's broad mindedness even greater. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it would, it would, it would, it would certainly reflect even better on him that he has that consciousness of, of, uh, of everyone's safety. You know, he doesn't say my wives and my children. That's he, true. He That's gives true. a broad kind of statement. So that is very true. That's very true. And I, and I can't, I can't dispute what I can't dispute what you're saying. I, I mean, I, I, I see your point and. Uh, and uh, and that certainly does that certainly does uh, reflect very well on him at this point. He's come a long way. I mean, really, <laughs> the guy has come a long way. <laughs> it's taken him twenty years, and uh, but he's learned a lot in this twenty years. <laughs> um, he has evolved. He has definitely evolved over over time. Uh, and so, and so he is, he is actively trying, and really when he's splitting the, splitting his, you know, his entourage in, into two camps, you know, he, he figures, I may not be able to avoid a tragedy here, but I can, <clears throat> I can mitigate the tragedy. 
Like I can make it less bad than it would be otherwise. I can I can limit. I can contain it. Uh, make it less less bad than it would be. Uh, and so he splits every every uh, every one there into into two groups. Uh, now now here's the other thing. Here's here's verses thirteen through uh, twenty one. <laughs> <laughs> the gifts okay he splits everything in two all the people in two he's thinking of he's thinking trying to mitigate the damage and then but then he is sending the gifts forward and we've already of course talked about the, the very real possibility that J jacob is genuinely contrite genuinely sorry uh, but he also if, if only because he himself has been such a jerk, he seems to be very aware of human nature. <laughs> and, and, and seems to be, seems to think that he really could appeal to Esau's greed <laughs> and, uh, and, there, and thereby the, the, therefore the, his capacity to be bought off. Uh, when he comes up, and and even the the and even the very fact that what does he do? He doesn't put all everything that he's willing to give to Esau. He doesn't put it all in one group. He puts it in way. He does it in waves. The gifts come in waves, so that there's there's space between one going before Esau. Esau seeing it, appreciating it. And then just as Esau is like, wow, that was a really impressive gift. Then, and only then, does the next wave come. And, and Esau is impressed all over again. Or at least that's what Jacob is hoping. And that this will happen over and over and over. So that it builds up. The, 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 the impressiveness of this gift is just keeps getting continually reinforced in Esau's mind. And so he, I mean, Jacob's thought about this <laughs> and, and is thinking about the psychology <laughs> of, of, of Esau's reaction. Uh, and he, and, and figures, you know, if anything is going to work, this is. Uh, I, I just love this. I, I, I love this, this whole thing, this whole, life. and again, not just that he presents a gift as such. I mean, that alone is, is kind of funny, but the way he presents the gift, <laughs> way, the fact that it does come in waves and not, <laughs> uh, so that's good. But at the end of the day, and it is literally the end of the day, <laughs> Jacob doesn't know what's going to happen. He's done everything he can to mitigate the damage, to placate Esau. But at the end of the day, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so we are set up for what I think is one of the, the most mysterious and interesting accounts in all of the Bible. It's a passage certainly that has meant a lot to me over the years, and I have preached on it several times. And every time I come back to it, I, I see something else. And it's just, a, it's just a wonderful passage. So let's read verses 22 through 32. Okay. Uh, and let me just say in advance here that nobody is completely sure. And when I say nobody, I mean readers and scholars. Nobody is completely sure what is happening here. Okay. <laughs> nobody is completely sure what's happening. All right. So verse 22. The same night he got up and he took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok, the Jabbok River. 
he took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me, the, the man, or the, the man, the angel, whatever, um, said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And the sun rose upon him as he passed, passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Oh. Okay. All right. So what's going on? <laughs> what's going on with this? What in the world is going on? <laughs> Let's get one thing out of, out of the way right away. This story is, among many other things, it does function as an etiology. Remember our favorite word, etiology. Uh, an etiology is an, is, a, is an explanation, a story that serves as an explanation for why a place is named what it is or why people do what they do. Uh, in this case, there's this custom among the Israelites, at least at the time of the writing, uh, that the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. And so it's an etiology for a cultural practice. It's a story that explains the origin of a particular practice. Okay, there is a lot more going on in this story than that. But that is one thing that is going on is that it is functioning as an etiology for this practice. Okay. Now let's get to the meat of it though. Let's get to the really interesting stuff. What is going on here? Well, I don't know what's going on really, but it seems strange that the angel had to ask him his name. If he comes down from wherever and wants to wrestle with Jacob, you'd think he'd at least know who he had chosen to wrestle with. I mean, he has to be able to say, you're going to be Israel. I understand that part of it, but uh -huh. it's just weird that, that he didn't say, Jacob, your name is now going to be Israel instead of what is your name? Uh -huh. so. I have a theory. I have a theory as to why he does. Okay. My, my theory is, is that he, he, wants, he wants to hear Jacob say it. He wants, he wants to hear Jacob say that his name is Jacob. Oh. Partly so he can set up the name change. There's that. But there's also the fact that comparing what the two names mean. Because Jacob, remember, means deceiver, leg pull. Okay. And Israel presumably means one who strives with God and human beings and prevails. And so it's, in other words, it's God, you, you could say that God is in essence calling Jacob to, to confession, to say, this is. This is who I have been, you know, kind of like uh, uh, I'm Jacob and I'm an alcoholic or <laughs> Jacob and I'm a, a deceiver and a leg puller, you know, that he's, he, God is offering him the opportunity to confess who he is, what he okay. has been. What he is. Yeah. yeah. And then, as we say, sets up this wonderful opportunity to 
transform him, redeem him. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. What else? What else? <laughs> of course, it's a good lesson in that old saying, your arm's too short to box with God. Uh, <laughs> you know, your arm's too short to wrestle with God as well. So despite <laughs> the fact that Jacob had all these uh, qualities of deception at one time, <clears throat> he's yeah. unable to do anything with this messenger or with God, whichever it may be. Mm -hmm. So yeah. don't, don't try to box with God. Yeah. The converse, that, that is true. That is true. And Jacob, you know, as we're going to see, Jacob, you know, gets that wound to his hip and he's going to live with that, that wound for the rest of his life. You know, this, this encounter does not leave him unscathed. And he's going to live with that for the rest of his life. But the converse of that is also true. God doesn't prevail against Jacob either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is, I mean, this adds to the mystery of the story. It adds to just the kind of weirdness of the story is that while it is true that Jacob does not overcome God, God does not overcome Jacob either. God is the one who is saying, let me go. <laughs> let me go for the day is breaking. And mean, all the while, Jacob, God has inflicted this wound on his hip. Jacob's not letting go, though. I mean, he's hurt. He's hurt. He's going to live with this for the rest of his life. But he's hanging on, you know. Uh, he's hanging on. He's not letting go. And God is like, uh look, I've got to go, you know, the day is, break. <laughs> you know, let me go, come on, and Jacob's not, Jacob is hanging on, um, and, and, uh, and in response, you know, let me go, for the day is breaking, Jacob says, I won't let you go, I won't let you go, unless you bless me, okay, now, it'd be real easy, I've said this in, uh, in some sermons on this, it would be easy to over-spiritualize Jacob saying that, you know, you know, I won't let you go unless you bless me. You could be easy to over, over spiritualize that. Oh, good. Jacob wants to be blessed by God. Okay. Well, we've seen what blessing in this book means. It means um, success. It means prospering. It means, um, prevailing over your enemies, okay? And it's important to remember right now that Jacob is facing, in the, in the coming day, he is facing his possible death, okay? As far as he knows, he could die tomorrow. Uh, Esau could kill him and kill everyone he loves, you know? And so when you, when you read this story and read that particular saying in context, what Jacob is actually saying here is, I'm not going to let you go until you have blessed me such that all that terrible stuff doesn't happen. But a few lines later, Jacob says he was wrestling with God. He figures yeah. it out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, there's no indication up to this point, up to the point of, uh, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Up to that point, there's no indication of who the stranger is. Um, and yet, when Jacob says that, it's an indicator that Jacob somehow perceives that this is a this is an unusual wrestling match. <laughs> this is this is somehow him wrestling with re somehow wrestling with God, somehow wrestling with the divine. Um, and but the way the story is set up is that it does start. In, and, and really even, I mean, even after we understand, even after Jacob understands that somehow this is God, 
and we understand somehow that this is God. Of course, it doesn't clear anything up. If anything, it adds to the mystery of the story. What is God doing wrestling somebody? You know, I mean, it, it just makes the story all the weirder, all the all the more mysterious. Um, but Jacob wrestling with what he at first perceives to be a man, perceives to be a another person wrestling all night. But somehow in the struggle, he realizes that he's not just wrestling with an ordinary wrestler. He's actually wrestling with God. Um, you could say, too, that in Jacob's own mind, this wrestling match itself is a kind of sum total of everything that Jacob has wrestled with in his life. It's like the encounter itself is a kind of metaphor, a kind of catch-all metaphor for every struggle Jacob's ever had. I mean, he has spent his entire life trying to trick and deceive his way into blessing, okay? I mean, it was the blessing that was always the point in his tricking of Esau for the birthright, his tricking of his father to receive the patriarchal blessing. Uh, he, he always saw blessing as something to be seized, something that had to be taken, something that would not just be given to him, but that in a way had to be earned <laughs> or, or if not earned, if not actually earned, uh, uh, wrestled away from someone else. I assume this is the J source the story is it's a mix it's a this part is yes this particular passage because is it's giving god very human quality right right wrestling and being held on to and yeah that, those things so. yeah that <laughs> stuff earlier that stuff earlier about seeing the angels in the camp uh that was from the east source uh, but uh, but yeah, this particular account is the is the J source, and the J source is marked by God appearing in human form or looking looking human. Yeah. Precisely because it's the J source, we also know that this is a very this is a very ancient strand of ancient Jewish tradition. Okay. Later Jewish tradition, which the priestly source is a good example of, okay, the P, the P source, the priestly source, is an example of later Jewish tradition. And later Jewish tradition is much, much closer to what we would recognize today as more, as more uh, theologically sophisticated. A little more um, where God is depicted in ways that, frankly, are more godlike <laughs> to, to us. Um, and that's typical of the P source. But yeah, the, the J source is a very old, uh, you could use the word more primitive, more primitive conceptions of divinity. Uh, that you see, do you see in the J story? And so, and so this is a, this story itself is an example. It's using, uh, it's using language and images in a, in a way that were typical of much, much longer ago. Okay. Ah. Do you, do you think maybe God is wrestling with him to see if he's worthy or not and figures if he dies, he's not worthy. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that old saying, whatever, whatever you, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. If you get a wound, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's certainly, um, <clears throat> whether that starts out, whether that's the intention starting out, I think it's certainly the case that when God renames him Israel, he is honoring Jacob's um, 
willingness to struggle, you know, his willingness to, to fight, you know, his, uh, his not letting go, you know, his continuing to strive, continuing to wrestle. God honors that. God respects that. And so that actually then gets play, that actually plays a role in his new name. So, hey, Charlie. Hello. Hey, Charlie, Hi. how are you doing? Fine. Good, good, good. Um, as you know, this is, this is being recorded. So you, uh, if you want to, when this is over, you can go back and check the first uh, 45 minutes that we uh, recorded already. But yeah, we're in uh, Genesis chapter 32. This Good. is uh, 32, right. This is uh, Jacob wrestling God. Okay. Yeah, so great story. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so, 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 so Jacob, you know, in, in a way, Jacob's been struggling all of his life. And he's been struggling against people. He's been trying to wrest blessings where he can. And now he's at, you know, he's in a situation where he's at the end of his rope. You know, he is facing his mortality. And not just, as we've said, not just his own personal mortality, but the mortality of his entire family, of his entire future and his posterity. He is facing the, the prospect of all of that going away, of all that being destroyed. Um, and so <clears throat> this is what is behind him saying, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you make it so that I, <laughs> I live through, I, I and my family live through the next day, you know, that we, mm -hmm. we prevail in this coming struggle. Um, and so God renames him. Now, the thing that I like to consider, this is a, this is just a great question that, that I've, I've wrestled with for a long time, is if Jacob is the eponymous ancestor of, you know, of Israel, you know, he's renamed Israel, so he is the eponymous ancestor of the Israelites, um, what is being said about God's people from that point on? And I'm talking the Jews and eventually the Christians, the Christians, you know, coming into the covenant, you know, coming into this relationship with God. <clears throat> Paul would speak of the new Israel, you know, or a, or a, uh, of all Israel. <clears throat> but it all goes back to this story. It all starts here. And so what does it say about the character, the nature of God's people, that God's people are named Israel, especially in light of this story and in light of the divine explanation for the name? Uh, I mean, consider, consider again, verse uh, 28. <clears throat> then the man said, God said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, no longer be called the leg puller, the deceiver, etc. But Israel, for you have striven with God and with human beings. You've striven with Esau, you've striven with Isaac, your father Isaac, you've striven with Laban, you've striven against the world. You know, you have, you, it has been Jacob against the world. And you've seen it that way. You, Jacob, have seen it that way. <clears throat> that it's been you against the world. You've striven with all of these things. And now, little did you know that in all of those strivings, you, in fact, the whole time we're also striving against God or striving with God. You are wrestling with God in all your wrestlings with people. And here you're wrestling this mysterious man. You are in fact wrestling with God. Um, and you never, ever gave up. You, you kept doing it. I mean, you would not let go. 
you would not let go. You kept, you kept struggling with God the whole time. You wouldn't let go. And that becomes something that God so takes notice of, so respects that he renames him Israel, renames him the one who strives with God and with human beings and prevails. But then not only that, but he not only in essence blesses him so that his posterity is saved, but all people in the Abrahamic covenant from that point on are going to be called that name. They're going to be called Israel. Okay. And even the Christians later on with Jesus in the new covenant, you know, it's the apostle Paul speaks of all Israel being saved all those who are in covenantal relationship with God are Israel. Uh, the thing I wrestle with then is, what does that say about who we are today as people who are in covenantal relationship with God? What does that what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us in a in this sense to be part of Israel? You have to well, one, one thing that strikes me is that given what we know now about what it means to be God's chosen people, the Jews have struggled and been persecuted for eons. <clears throat> so it wasn't easy for Jacob, and it hasn't been easy for them either. And certainly right. the same thing is true of the early Christians. Right. And now it's <clears throat> becoming a little more of a struggle <clears throat> Christian just because of how Christianity is viewed in our society. We're shrinking, mm -hmm. obviously. And so I, it's a, con a continuation of the struggle of how Israel was born mm -hmm. and continued, I say, for eons to be persecuted all over the world in mm -hmm. horrible ways, mm -hmm. but still are, are God's chosen people. Right. Uh, right. And Christians have faced a lot of those same struggles and are continuing to face them <clears throat> in different ways now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a this is a great yeah that's a, I mean it's a great point and a, just a very fruitful way of kind of framing the question going forward. Um, you know, certainly it's the case that you know we speak of the election of God's people, the election of Israel as God's chosen people, and yet that chosenness, that election in, in terms of Israel's history, in terms of national Israel's history, that this election was not an election to, you know, to uh, everything going right for you all the time and, and being number one and all this. In fact, if anything, as, as, and certainly as the Hebrew biblical tradition, you know, developed and grew, you know, through the, the time of the prophets and whatnot, that this election came to be viewed as uh, an election for a role, not a, an election to favored status or to be always be the winners and all this, but a, an election to being God's servant people. And sometimes that servanthood meant persecution in the world. Sometimes it meant uh, not being the winners. In fact, in, in some cases, it meant being the losers, you know. And yet, so the theology went, that that, that suffering was not for nothing. That it was that ultimately those sufferings would be, uh, would be redeemed and God would ultimately keep the promise that he made to Abraham that through you and your descendants, blessing will come to the whole world. You remember that, remember that from the promise to, to Abraham. 
Um, but it's not going to be easy. <laughs> and so, yes, I'm electing you and your descendants, but it's not going to always go well for you. But it is ultimately, ultimately going to bring blessing to the whole world. This is a way, this is an important reminder to go back and read um, Isaiah chapter 53, which, uh, you know, from the Christian perspective is, is thought of as the suffering servant uh, chapter of Isaiah. And it's historically within the Christian church, it's always been associated with Jesus. It's been connected to, a, it's been understood as a prophecy of the future Messiah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that identification per se. Uh, it's certainly a way that the early Christians understood the life of Jesus and what God was doing in the life of Jesus. But understand that that text prior to Christianity, prior to the coming of Jesus and so forth, was never understood by anybody as a messianic prophecy. It was understood to be speaking of Israel itself, always. Um, the, and, and it's quite clear if you, you know, if you, if you read the, all the passages from roughly chapter 40 through about 55, uh, there are several instances where this second Isaiah, writing from the, probably writing from the time of the exile or perhaps towards the end of the Babylonian exile in the mid to late 500s BC, uh, it's, it's very clear from the context that who, the, that the servant, the suffering servant of, of, his, of, his, of his interest in those chapters is not a person. At least for him, it is not a person. It is a nation. It is a people. It is the, the people of Israel. They are the servant. They are the suffering servant vis-a-vis -vis the world. And they are the ones who had no form or comeliness that we, we the world, should look at him. Uh, he had no, you know, we, uh, we the, the world despised him and they, they did all this but that God would ultimately vindicate him, that God would ultimately vindicate his servant. Well, they, again, second Isaiah was thinking of the nation itself, of the people as a whole, being God's servant, being God's servant people in the world, and that the sufferings that were inflicted upon this people would ultimately be answered by God's vindication and God's bringing salvation and blessing to the whole world through those sufferings. Now, you can understand, if you go back and read chapter 53 in light of what I just said, you can understand why the early Christians would look at the life of Jesus and apply those words of Isaiah to Jesus. You can understand why they did. It makes perfect sense. But it's important to know that prior to Jesus, nobody ever understood the text that way. They understood it, frankly, in the way that Isaiah himself understood it. And that is as speaking of the people, the people of Israel itself, and that they are the servant. They are the ones who are suffering, but God is ultimately going to turn those sufferings into salvation not just for them, but salvation for the whole world. Uh, <clears throat> and the bottom line is, is that this struggling with God, we're the elect people and yet we're elected for what? <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> that all of this striving, this struggling with God ultimately, ultimately has ultimately follows in redemption, okay? But this is the very character of being God's people. This is what it means to be God's people. Now, to extend it then to Christians, um, it's, it's a continuation of standing up for God's kingdom, God's kingdom, which includes justice 
and peace and standing against uh, uh, oppressive powers that deny basic dignity and humanity of people. Uh, it's it, it when when one stands for that kind of human dignity and whatnot, you are you are standing against so much of the powers of this world, um, and you are kind of asking for it. You're asking for trouble, uh, and Jesus knew that better than anybody. <laughs> And, uh, and so those who follow Jesus then kind of inherit that stance vis-a-vis -vis the world where you can kind of expect some trouble. Uh, but as John Le Representative John Lewis, you know, once described it, it's, uh, it's good to get into good trouble, you know, <laughs> find some good trouble to get into. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's what you know, that's the way I apply this text to our situation as Christians today is that this is a call into the striving, the struggling, the wrestling of all God's people in every age. Uh, it's not a life of ease and comfort. It's a life of struggling, striving, and wrestling. Um, and that striving, struggling, and wrestling can take many different forms. Um it can be, you know, very existential. It can be very circumstantial. Um, I know in my own life, uh, some of my some of my own struggling has been of a, of an intellectual variety, or of a or the variety of, uh, you know, trying to find uh, trying to find a, 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 a form, trying to find a faith that that provided a sense of coherence and meaning in life and, um, and finding, you know, certain ways of constructing that meaning to be inadequate. Um, and so, and so wrestling in a sense, wrestling with God in the sense of doubting God, <laughs> fighting with God, arguing with God, but never quite walking away from God either. Um, the, uh, there was a wonderful writer, um, he was a former Anglican Bishop of uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, named Richard Holloway. And he has written of, he offered a phrase that I just love. He calls people like this, people who you know, don't have it easy with God, fight with God, argue with God, doubt God. <laughs> I mean, but don't give up on God, who stay engaged with God. He calls them God botherers. <laughs> and he means it in sort of a double sense, both in terms of God botherers, as in I bother with God, even, even if voices within myself say, you know, you ought to just give up on God, forget about God. You know, you keep bothering with God. But there's also the aspect of not just bothering with God, but bothering God. <laughs> like, how long, oh Lord? Why is this happening? Why do innocent people suffer? You know, why is there so much injustice in the world? You know, so bothering God with, peppering God with questions and, and, and uh, complaints even, you know, um, but coming back again and again, striving with God, wrestling with God, uh, struggling with God in this way, God bothering, bothering with God. This oh. is the very nature of our being the people of God. Yeah, Lois. This, this was a book you're talking about? Uh, no, it's not a book. It's well, it's in a it is in a book. Um, I'm trying to think of where I came across it. It's uh, the, the author is Richard Holloway. H-O-L-L-O way. Holloway. H-O-L-L-O way. Holloway. Richard Holloway, he was the former Anglican Bishop of Edinburgh, Scotland, and he is an absolutely exquisitely beautiful writer. Uh, he sounds like my kind of person. Oh, you'd, oh, you'd love him. 
You'd I'm love gonna, it. I'm going to look him up. Yeah. Totally. Totally. He's written a number of really wonderful books. Um, but somewhere in one of his books, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, he, he, and I, and I, there's actually something on the internet that I think I can find and I'll send it to all of you where he, he speaks of God bothering and, uh, uses that phrase and makes some, makes a lot of it. Uh, let's see. I think my dad got disconnected and now is coming back. So is the takeaway, um, you're really, you people, this nation is really going to suffer, but there's going to be a reward in the end? It's, yeah, but the reward, the reward has to be understood. It's not just that it's going to be good for us. It's going to be good for everybody. The idea that, yeah, you're, yes, you are suffering. And yes, you are suffering in part because you're, you're hanging on, you're hanging on with God and, Mm -hmm. The more you do it, the more you're gonna you're you're gonna you're gonna suffer in this. It isn't gonna go easy for you doing this, but the payoff is that blessing is going to come not just to you. It's gonna come to the whole world because of you, because of your hanging in there. And uh, the blessing is. <laughs> well, it's that's the thing that so, seems to still be in process, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and by way, and in terms of prophetic promise, what we can, what I could point to would be like, um, like Isaiah chapter two, uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 65, um, the promises of the, the new, the vision of the new heaven and the new earth in, uh, in Revelation, uh, all of these things look to a future in which God's peace and God's justice are not just true for Israel, but are true for the whole world. Okay. Mm-hmm. And in large part, it those promises or that 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 assurance is predicated upon the history of God and God's people wrestling with each other. <laughs> staying remember because remember remember here's one final thing this is kind of how i'll probably conclude today is that remember <clears throat> that early on in this text in this in this book of genesis we've seen how we've seen how god is tempted so to speak to give up on creation god is god is wrestling with the idea of giving up on creation, giving up on the human project. And we see with the whole flood story and then his God's reaction to the, to the flood, his response to the flood, he decides he's not going to give up on humanity. You know, they can, these people can, you know, human beings can irritate him to no end and can test his patience in remarkable ways. But he's not going to do that again. He's not going to give up on the human race. Well, what we see here is almost like a flip of that, is that God's people, God's true people are the people that don't, who kind of do the return the favor, who don't give up on God either, who stay in the struggle, stay in the fight. And even if, even if sometimes it looks like God is the enemy, Okay, because sometimes it feel it at least can feel like that God is the enemy. It can at least feel that way, uh, and and yet we stay in the fight. Yeah, think of poor Job. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, that's a great example. That's a great example. Job, Job never curses God and is done with it. The entire book, almost the entire book of Job, exists because. <laughs> Job did not curse God and die. He did not curse God and walk away. He engaged, he was like trying to get God to answer him, answer for himself, you know, to answer for what happened. And he, and, and so you have 35 chapters of exquisite poetry of Job demanding that God explain himself. Mm-hmm. He doesn't walk away. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the book, and I love this, I love this fact, and at the end of the book, Job's refusal to give up on God, even though he's angry, pardon my, angry as hell, 
<laughs> as hell at God. He doesn't give up on God. He keeps the conversation going such as it is. And at the end of the book, in chapter 42, I believe, God God's compares Job with Job's friends. And Job's friends have spent this whole time saying, you know, Job, you should just repent. You know, you've, you've sinned against God. And this is why all these terrible things have happened to you. God comes after Job's friends. Job's friends were, they understood themselves as God's defenders. Job was wrong. God is right. And so we're defending God against Job's malicious charges. And at the end, chapter 42, God says, you, Job's friends, have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. What has Job been doing for the last 35 chapters? He's been arguing. <laughs> He's, He's been, been bothering right. God. He's been bothering God. And at the end of the book, God essentially blesses that. <laughs> essentially blesses the complaints and the arguing and all of that. And says that the guys who were trying to defend God, who were putting themselves in the position of being God's defenders, were actually wrong. Oh my gosh, that's just, that's just, that's incredible. I mean, that is just so awesome. So anyway, okay, good stuff, good stuff. I love this. Okay, well, why don't we, uh, let's close with prayer and then we will, uh, we will wrap up for today. Okay, let's pray. Oh God, we do give you thanks for this time, this opportunity to, to gather together as we do each week and to, to wrestle with you and to wrestle with these, uh, with these scriptures, these stories. Sometimes they make sense to us, but other times they don't. And it would be easy to just walk away and say that they don't matter, that they have no relevance for today. And yet, and yet you call us to to really be your people and to stay in conversation, to stay in the striving and the struggling and the wrestling with you and the stories about you and, you and the history of your engagement with your people. Help us to be your people in that way. We pray now for all those who are struggling in body and mind or circumstance. We remember Bill Allworth and, and pray for him and his continued healing and, and pray for, uh, for Lois and for, uh, for her care for him. Pray for all who need your special touch of healing right now. And so now we pray all these things in Jesus's name. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's so any update on Bill or He's slowly yeah. getting better. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's really slow, but we, we go back to Emory on Thursday and he'll have a checkup and I'll know more then, but he, he is improving uh, every day a little bit. That's good to yeah. hear. Good to hear. Been, been rooting for him, been praying for him for, for some time. And so I that's appreciate good, that. very good to hear. All right. Well, y'all have a good rest of the week and, uh, and I will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Hey.